this edition of Southern Newsweek, controversy at Otago Polytechnic as its council decides to up tertiary fees for the fifth year in a row. A local man caught out by an online video scam that resulted in blackmail warns others to beware. And locals turn out to support the reinstatement of a Kiwi book that's been banned. Kia ora, I'm Holly Buchanan. Student fees are increasing by the maximum amount for the fifth consecutive year at Otago Polytechnic. They're rising 3% in a controversial move by the Polytechnic Council. And that means courses are roughly 20% more expensive than they were in 2010. In what's become almost a formality in recent years, fees are on the up for local Polytechnic students. The Polytechnic Council is increasing domestic and international fees by the 3% maximum for next year. And despite consistent increases, Communications Director Mike Waddell says the decision isn't made lightly. It's a tricky one. Uh, we don't put them up just for the hang of putting them up. We know what the needs are of our community and we know what the demands are of our students. For us to deliver that, we have to do that increased fees. Maximum fee increases are set each year by the government, usually around 3 or 4 per cent. And Waddell says it's necessary for the Polytechnic to adopt them as the government's underfunding the tertiary sector. The only way that we can actually increase any revenue to be able to develop and keep developing programs, new buildings, is by increasing student fees. It's a reluctant move, I'd have to say, but it is sort of one of those moves that, in a way, we're forced in a corner so that we can continue to develop, which is really good for the city. He acknowledges that managing money can be tough for students, and he says that's a real concern for the council as it is for the Polytechnic Student Association, which has made its stance on the issue known. They expressed real concern about it. I think they actually had quite a balanced view, a frustration that the funding wasn't coming from government, and an, and an understanding that the Polytechnic needs to continually to develop. Um, but there is a price to that, and that is an increase of 3% in student fees. The 3% increase is being applied to all programs, costing domestic students an extra 300 odd dollars a year and international students even more. Ruby McAndrew, 39, Dunedin News. A Paralympic gold medalist is helping one local organisation to observe a major milestone. Staff, clients and guests of CCS Disability Action Otago are celebrating eight decades of service in the South. And they're reflecting on the positive way attitudes have changed towards disability over the years. A sizeable cake to celebrate a substantial birthday. CCS Disability Action Otago staff are busily preparing for the organisation's 80th anniversary celebration. And acting regional manager Mel Smith says it's a time to look back at its long history as well as its progression over the years. In terms of um, just the way that we look at disability, um, over the last 80 years that's changed a lot. So we've gone from real institutional thinking um, right through to, um, you know, really it's, there's no um, specific needs. It's just making sure that there's an equal playing field for people. Smith says the organisation's role has changed a lot since its establishment in 1935, moving away from institutional care to more one-on-one -on -one support. And she says that's helped to significantly change attitudes about disability for the better. There are questions to be asked and there are conversations to be had and I guess um, having disabled people step into that space and do that and you know be out there and be in the spotlight as well has meant that, um, that people are asking questions, they are interested and they're not so maybe nervous, I don't know. I think sometimes if you don't know you're not really sure what you're allowed to say and what you're not allowed to say. Otago Paralympian Adam Hall is in town for the celebration, taking time out from training to share his story and the importance of having goals. And he says the work CCS does is crucial, particularly in the way it's led by those living with disability. People within CCS are kind of there as a resource to help guide whatever it is that, that may be needed. And I can relate that to my sport as well, is that the program that I have to be a successful athlete is, is athlete driven, so it's what the athlete needs, then the coaches or the other resources that I have provide that environment that I need to perform. And Hall's looking forward to continuing his sporting success at the next Winter Paralympics to inspire others living with disability. A mission that will be shared by CCS Disability Action for many more years to come. Ruby McAndrew, 39, Dunedin News. A Dunedin man is alerting Interpol to an online scammer after being the victim of blackmail. 
The social media professional was filmed without permission during a live internet video conversation and he hopes his misfortune serves as a warning to other residents. Daryl Baser uses the internet every day. He's a self-employed social media advisor for small local businesses. And despite his online know-how, he's just been the victim of a frightening internet scam. It all started with what he thought was an innocent Skype conversation with a new contact in London. And as the conversation finished, I got these messages that said, uh, we've got these images of you, and it looks like you're doing this. They weren't pleasant in images at all. Um, parts of it was actually me, and parts of it wasn't. He says the result was frighteningly realistic. It looked like I was committing a lewd act, shall we say. The blackmailer demanded thousands of dollars, threatening to release the offensive images online. Baser tried negotiating and lost sleep, worrying about whether the footage was circulating for the world to see. I've had uh, a couple of nervous Google searches. He's reported the incident to Interpol as well as Dunedin Police and he's asking friends to heed his warning so as not to fall prey. Do not Skype anybody you don't know well outside of, outside of social media life. He'll continue to use the internet and develop his social media business but he won't be Skyping strangers anytime soon. Yeah, I'm particularly embarrassed as someone who you know, has recently started a social media company. Um, to be caught like this is just phenomenal, um, but a really good wake-up call. A warning for all internet users to be careful when logging on. Rosie Mannins, 39, Dunedin News. The New Zealand Transport Agency is gearing up for a costly project linking Port Chalmers to Dunedin City. It's about to construct a shared walking and cycling path from St Leonard's to the port and that will require cooperation from the country's largest rail transport operator. Checking plans for a multi-million dollar pathway. Jason Forbes of the NZTA is managing the project to construct a shared walking and cycling path from St Leonard's to Port Chalmers. It's expected to take two years to build and will cost between five and ten million dollars. Uh, we're currently working through the detailed design and that's coming near completion. Uh, we'd expect to have our detailed design complete around Christmas. The 5.2 kilometre stretch of path will connect to that already in place between the stadium and St Leonard's. It will be undertaken in sections with some of the most tricky parts attempted first. The NZTA has to reclaim some of the harbour to build alongside the railway. And Forbes says the project wouldn't be happening without KiwiRail's cooperation. We still need to obtain our consents, go through final agreements with both KiwiRail and the Dunedin City Council because Council will be maintaining the path and the majority of the path is on KiwiRail's land. All costs are being met by the NZTA with KiwiRail covering its expenses to shift a section of the tracks. The council will be responsible for maintaining the path once it's finished, something residents have been wanting for more than 10 years. It's a very busy highway with the port at the end and there's quite a lot of narrow pinch points that are quite dangerous for road users. About 250 people a day use the completed path between St Leonard's and the city and the numbers are expected to increase once the full length of it's finished, connecting Port Chalmers and the residential communities in between. Rosie Mannins, 39, Dunedin News. Locals are slamming the temporary ban on a New Zealand book as perverse and unacceptable. Dozens of residents have assembled to protest the interim restriction order on Ted Dawes into the river, and they have a novel approach to speaking out. In complete silence, these people condemn the nation's first book ban in more than 20 years. A complaint from Christian organisation Family First prompted the interim ban on young adult novel Into the River. Protest organiser Dr Emma Neal says the book can't be sold, displayed or even read out loud. And that's got locals exercising their last right in relation to the work, silently reading it. I think this is actually a case of a really perverse kind of um, tall poppy syndrome because the attention that it garnered as a literary success meant that um, 
people mistakenly thought that it was directed at children, and it's not. It's directed at young adults and adults. The complaint comes as an age restriction on the book is removed. Concerns relate to content about sex and drug use, but Neil says nothing's glorified in the novel. She believes the interim ban tramples the rights of all Kiwis to freely access information. And other protesters echo her call for the ban to be overturned. I'm a high school teacher and um, I don't think that it's up to outside gatekeepers to make these decisions for our young people really. I think that's a, a parental role and a community role. Protesters also read other controversial works from around the world. Similar displays are happening nationwide, as well as overseas, and Neil's pleased with the groundswell of support. We've had a lot of messages from people saying that they're going to read the book um, at 12 noon their time um, on, a, on the Thursday, September the 10th, or in their own time to show solidarity for Ted Dorr, the author, and in support of freedom of access to information, ideas and opinions. She helped edit Into the River and says its temporary ban while the complaints handled is a dangerous move for freedom in New Zealand. Freedom she hopes to stand up for by silently speaking out. David DeLorean, 39, Dunedin News. Still to come on Southern Newsweek, the art of landscaping on a small scale is shared with interested residents and a new community group raises money for a unique item that may help parents suffering loss. Welcome back. Dunedin's newest Rotary Group is making its mark on the community with a unique fundraiser. Members have collected thousands of garments and accessories to sell in a pop-up store on George Street and the proceeds are set to help grieving parents. Meet the city's latest Rotarians, members of NRG Dunedin, the new Rotary generation. They're staging a pop-up op shop in the CBD to raise money for a cuddle cot at Queen Mary Maternity. It's so when a baby's born, um, still born, it gives the parents more time to spend because um, it's a specially designed heat pad um, with their child to say goodbye. Walker organises pop-up shops in her professional capacity and was keen to use her knowledge and resources for a charitable cause and she's overwhelmed by the community's response. It was unbelievable, we put it on Facebook and overnight we had over 500 people say they were coming, which for an event on Facebook is quite big. And then just putting the cause out and asking for donations of clothes, people who I didn't even know were asked, wanting to drop them off in local businesses. One firm even donated eight large bags of brand new menswear. With each item priced at $5, it's hoped this fundraiser will pay for one cuddle cot worth $5,000. And NRG members are keen to increase their charitable efforts within the city. Change Rotary's image a little bit from male, pale and stale to realise that young people can come and help their community. And that really is what we're doing. We're a random selection of youngish people who just want to help. The group started in May and so far it has about a dozen members, all keen to welcome others. Henderson says it's all about boosting community goodwill but members also get a lot out of their involvement. You get to meet a whole new range of people, and so there's the social side of it, but also it's really great just being able to give back and help your community. And based on this project's success, residents are set to see a lot more charitable initiatives from NRG Dunedin members. Rosie Mannins, 39, Dunedin News. A revolutionary way to preserve teeth and prolong the life of dental fillings has been developed at the University of Otago. Local academics have invented a unique product with plans to manufacture it commercially and that could lead to brighter smiles throughout the world. These local academics have been working together for five years on a revolutionary dental product, a solution to the common problem of tooth decay and dental filling degradation. So well aware that nothing lasts forever, unfortunately. You'd like to think that your fillings last forever but they don't. And one of the reasons that they fail is if we get decay uh, in around the margins underneath them again. So Dr Schwass of the Dental School looked to the university's chemistry department for help because the existing product for killing bacteria and prolonging the life of dental fillings has a major downside. But it leaves a black mark on the tooth surface, a very, very obvious black mark. 
Dr Carla Maladandri's taken compounds already used in dentistry to create a product involving nanoparticles, tiny amounts of active agent that have the desired effect without staining teeth. It's absolutely fantastic. I mean, I remember where I was when I had the idea of how I was going to make these. You know, I, I remember that very, very clearly. So to have seen it within a short period of time, four or five years, um, get to a stage where it's gone off to a manufacturer is, is really exciting. And Dr Schwass is keen to try the product locally once it's been manufactured overseas. I hope that we're one of the first few who get to use it and we get to use it on our own patients. The product's licensed by the university's investment arm, which provided an initial proof of concept grant years ago. It's received more than $100,000 in government funding, less than half the total cost. And while those details are commercially sensitive, it's expected the product will be ready for use in a few years. Rosie Mannins, 39, Dunedin News. Locals are learning an ancient Chinese art form in a bid to increase cultural engagement in the city. A miniature landscape workshop has been held at the Dunedin Chinese Garden and it's all part of National Week of Activities. Getting their hands dirty in the name of tradition. Residents partake in a joint project between the Chinese Garden and local bonsai society to promote the Asian culture by creating miniature gardens called Pinjing. Pinjing uh, is the Chinese form of what people more commonly would know as bonsai. Um, which is an art form of creating in miniature a landscape or a tree that you would see in nature. Chinese bonsai practitioners use rocks, soil, trees, clay and moss to create small landscapes. It's a skill that Alice says can take a lifetime to master but can also be picked up in a matter of hours. To be an expert it will take many years and lots of practice and guidance from one of the world-renowned masters. Um, but for the average person, you can make a reasonable job with um, a few hours' instruction. This workshop's been held for Chinese Language Week. It's proved to be a successful evening for the group, and members hope to hold more workshops in the future. This was a, a trial uh, which we ran for the staff um, of the Chinese Garden. We have a public workshop next week, their success all depends on public demand and resources. And Chinese garden staff hope the Penjing movement catches on in Dunedin as more locals become involved. Annabelle Dick, 39 Dunedin News. A share of the profit from this year's auto spectacular show is going towards the retention of Dunedin's only physiotherapy pool. Thousands of classic car enthusiasts gathered in the city for the annual event. And with the best sets of wheels from more than 30 car clubs on display, it had fanatics revving their engines. A day for motorheads to indulge. Some of the South's most luxurious cars are displayed in a joint project between Otago's Classic Motoring Club and Ford and Falcon Club. From a 2010 Supersport Bentley to a 1934 Duesenberg J Phantom, there was something available for any taste. It was the Mosler GT3 race car from Highlands Motorsport Park. It was that fabulous yellow Mustang over there from Mark's Cars. 31 car clubs here can, uh, have put displays in of around five cars. Formerly called Swaparama, the show has been running since 1974. Each year a charity is chosen to receive some of the money raised from the show and this year it's for the local physio pool. We've selected the Otago Therapeutic Pool Trust, which is a very worthwhile course. Casey says there's a real need for classic car shows like this, the only one of its kind in this part of New Zealand. And he says interest is growing with the numbers up from last year. I think we may be up a little on last year. We had 4,000 people through last year, including all the kids. Kids love it because we turn on free entertainment from face painting and all that sort of thing. So it's, it's probably on a par or a little better than last year. With around 150 cars and bikes on display, the show was a success for the club. And members have no plan to turn off their engines anytime soon. Annabelle Dick, 39 Dunedin News. And just to head on Southern Newsweek, Otago's most promising divers are lining up to make a splash in an annual swimming competition and thousands of school kids do some exploring of cultural nature through performance.
Welcome back. The region's most promising young divers have been putting months of training to the test. Just over 20 competitors recently converged at Moana Pool for the annual South Island Diving Championships. And the championships gave divers the opportunity to make their mark ahead of national meets. Attempting to achieve perfection while falling. Divers from Otago give their all to impress judges at the South Island Diving Championships. And this year, local divers are only up against themselves, with no other South Island clubs able to participate. It's for clubs within the South Island. Unfortunately, we've only got one club because Christchurch got um, knocked out with the earthquake. But we do have guest divers from the North Island from Diving Waikato. The loss of the Christchurch facility has meant a substantial drop in South Island divers. But Shvivink says a bounce back is likely, with a new Christchurch dive pool in the planning stages. Something competitor Rebecca Fisher is looking forward to as the only person nationwide competing in the women's open platform event, crediting the tough nature of the sport for the small numbers involved. Not everybody can do it. There's, there's the, you've got to be graceful and you've got to be so brave as well. Like, it's just scary. You just stand on the board shaking, but then you just have to push through it and it takes a really strong mind to be able to do that. And you have to be powerful but look nice at the same time. Fisher says there are a lot of up-and-coming divers in the Otako club and she says the challenge for them is conquering their nerves and going all in with each dive. You've got that pressure, you've got one chance to do it right and if you do it wrong and it's too bad you just move on and I think a lot of people get quite intimidated by that. With each dive judges are looking for fluid movement, how competitors look in the air and the way they enter the water and these guys hope they'll rise to the high standards expected particularly lower grade divers who want all the experience they can get ahead of the Skills National in Hamilton at the end of the month. Ruby McAndrew, 39, Dunedin News. St Leonard's school pupils are buzzing after a recent visit from a local beekeeper. They've been learning about the important insects for National Bee Aware Month and the lesson is revealing the condition of local bees as disease and parasites plague the national population. Suiting up. St Leonard's school pupils learn about bees from local bug lover Murray Rickson. He's explaining life as a beekeeper, visiting the school to raise the profile of the flying insects. There is passion and he hopes to inspire the next generation of beekeepers for Bee Aware Month. It gives the public a chance to sort of consider what they can do for the, the population of bees in this country. Uh, we have a, a very good industry in New Zealand of beekeeping and the public can help us a huge amount by registering beehives and looking after beehives. These pupils have been learning all about bees in the lead up to this visit. Rickson's demonstrating with a full hive to give children a close look at the bugs. That's taught the adults a lot too. About the number of types of bees in the hive and also like how fast and how far they go and also that they're colour blind. I never knew that bees were colour blind so it was quite cool to learn that. Large hives can include tens of thousands of bees. The vast majority are female with just a handful of males. Rickson says local hives are thriving as bee populations around the country battle against disease. We're quite lucky in the south, we have quite a nice climate, we don't have the humidity problems and, uh, and we have a, a good uh, period of winter where the bees can shut down their breeding cycle and, and, and have a rest period if you wish. Rickson says the number of beehives nationwide will hit a new record of 600,000 in coming months and St Leonard's School will be responsible for one as pupils gear up to control their own hive and fundraise with the honey. David DeLorean, 39, Dunedin News. And finally, thousands of school children have been exploring their culture at this year's Polyfest. The annual Otago event boasted a local guest drawing hundreds of spectators and colourful performances were seen over the course of the multi-day showcase. A time for children to get multicultural. These are just a few of thousands of Otago kids performing in this year's Polyfest, a Māori and Pacifica arts festival celebrating the Pacific cultures through performance. Polyfest is an event for early childhood uh, centres and schools uh, to present the performances that they have been working on and learning um, for uh, kapahaka, you know, Māori performance items and also for uh, a range of Pacific items. With more than 4,000 students from 118 schools taking part, Otago Polyfest stands out from similar events around the country. 
and Love Fiso says there's no limitation to being a part of the multi-day event. It's quite unique in some respects because it goes from early childhood right through to primary. It does include both Māori um, and Pacific, whereas a lot of other events across the country only do Pacific or only do primary or only do secondary. Local boy Maka Pohatu opened the festival with his band the Modern Māori Quartet. He says being involved in Polyfest is a crucial part of what it means to grow up in a Pacific nation. There's a, a real, just a, a real awesome family vibe and you know everyone's proud to see their kids on stage and um, half of the tutors uh, all were those kids back in the day so you know it's a, it's a huge, yeah, it's a cool legacy. Hours of volunteer help, extensive planning and several grants were required to make the $80,000 festival happen. And after more than two decades of Polyfest, La Fesa wants to supersize the successful event, making it even bigger and better next year. Annabelle Dick, 39 Dunedin News. And that's all for this edition of Southern Newsweek. Please do visit our website, dunedintv.co.nz, where you can download Southern Newsweek and watch individual clips of 39 Dunedin News or webcast the show. I'm Holly Buchanan, thanks for watching. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on.